Welcome to the central force problem. Today we are going to discuss the equations of motion and the first integrals. To begin with, uh, we are going to specialize to problems where the, the generalized potential reduces to a, a spherically symmetric function which depends only on the radial distance and the, and the relative distance between the two particles, so not on the orientation of the system or on uh, the relative velocity and so on. The problem thus described is that of a particle of mass m moving about the center of force located at the origin of the coordinate system. Spherical symmetry implies that the orbital angular momentum is conserved. What follows is that the dot product between uh, the, uh, the relative radius vector and the angular momentum is zero, which implies that the relative vector is always in a plane normal to the fixed direction of the orbital angular momentum. This holds if the orbital angular momentum itself is non-vanishing. However, if, if it happens to be zero, then it follows that uh, the, the radius vector has to be parallel with the, the velocity. Uh, the velocity itself can be written in um, spherical polar coordinates, as here, so wh what this will imply immediately is that uh, obviously the, the first cross product vanishes, but the other one is, uh, is non-vanishing, and since the, the total expression has to be zero, it follows that the angular velocity has to be zero. So the general conclusion is that the central force motion is always in a plane. The three coordinates thus involved are r, the, the radial distance, psi, which is going to be the zenith or collatitude, and theta, which is the azimuth. If the polar axis is perpendicular to the orbital angular momentum, the motion is always in the plane normal to the polar axis. As such, the zenith angle is pi over 2, and the rate of change in time of the zenith angle is 0. Then, fixing the direction of the orbital angular momentum has reduced now the number of degrees of freedom to 2. The constant magnitude of the orbital angular momentum can be used further to complete the solution. And this is done as follows. The, the Lagrangian is going to be the difference between kinetic and potential energy, and its spherical polar coordinates will have the expression written here. Since it does not depend explicitly on the azimuthal angle, it follows that the, the rate of change of the canonical momentum conjugate to it is zero, and then the quantity m r squared and uh, dot theta, which is obtained from the, the corresponding Lagrange equation is constant in time and is equal with L, the, the magnitude of the orbital angular momentum. Uh, what follows from equation 3.7 and what we, what we have written here already, so is that uh, the, this quantity is constant in time and is equal to what is known as the aerial velocity or the area swept by the radius vector in unit time. Uh, the, 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 the differential area element is, is, written, is written as here, so if we take its time derivative, we obtain uh, the, this, this expression, the, the quantity over here. So in effect, well, what we have proved here is uh, known as Kepler's second law of planetary motion the radius vector sweeps equal areas in equal times. So uh, this statement is true for any central force law and is not uh, specific to, to gravitational problems where, where Kepler first, uh, first observed it. Now the, the second Lagrange equation is um, going to involve the radial coordinate and uh, following through with the established procedure has the expression here and we can write this in several equivalent ways uh, using the, the definition of force in Newtonian mechanics we can obtain the the equivalent expression here and then using equation 3.8 which is just the the conservation of angular momentum we can rewrite it as um, as here 
Furthermore, uh, notice that because the Lagrangian does not depend explicitly on time, uh, as we have discussed in the previous chapter, it follows that the total energy is conserved. But this can be proved from the uh, from the equation of motion for the radial coordinate itself, uh, because for one thing, from so for, from three point twelve, uh, it follows immediately that the uh, the result here is true. And then, as we as we have um, seen in the past, uh, a trick that can be used is the following. So the the expression here can be written as the following derivative. And then it follows that the the result just above can be can be immediately written like this, which simply says that the total energy is constant in time. As there are two variables, r and theta, a total of four integrations are required to solve the equations of motion. The first two integrations have led to results 3.8 and 3.15, which are the conservation of angular momentum and the conservation of energy. Now, from the conservation of energy itself, we can perform a further integration by isolating the radial velocity. We can write it like this, and then it follows that the, uh, the differential of time is equal to the differential of radius divided by, um, by this quantity. And we can formally integrate this to obtain time as a function of radius, which is going to be given by the by the quadrature here. And in principle, at least, this this result can be inverted in order to obtain the radius as a function of time. So this is a. Uh, uh, the written statement of uh, what I have said previously, you know, knowing time as a function of r and the three constants here, which are the initial radius, the energy, and the angular momentum, we can in principle obtain the radius as a function of time and these three constants. And then using equation 3.8, which was the conservation of angular momentum, we can obtain the differential of the azimuthal angle as the expression here. So integrating this we can obtain the angle as a function of time of the initial value, the, the initial angle and the angular momentum. So results 318 and 320 are the final quadratures involving four constants of integration, which are the total energy, the magnitude of the orbital angular momentum, the initial radius and the initial angle. Another possibility would have involved the set involving um, the initial coordinates, so the initial radius and the initial angle, and the initial components of the velocity, the initial radial velocity and the initial angular velocity. And this set would uh, determine the values of E and L, so the, the, cons the conserved quantities corresponding to energy and angular momentum. However, the, the former choice is the preferred one, so the, the choice here. And uh, this is due to the fact that a classical description in terms of energy and angular momentum can be carried over into quantum mechanics, where the, the latter choice, so the choice involving initial coordinates and velocities, uh, is meaningless. In conclusion, we have uh, deduced Kepler's second law of planetary motion as a general property of central forces. We have established the conservation laws for central force problems, namely the conservation of angular momentum and energy. We have derived and formally integrated the equations of motion for the central force problem in terms of four integration constants, which are the initial coordinates, radius and angle, angular momentum and energy. And in the following, we will discuss the equivalent uh, one-dimensional problem and the classification of orbits. That being said, I want to thank you very much for watching. I hope you found the video worth your time and I will catch you later. Goodbye.